So thank you for coming. Um, and this is the second in this series of sessions called Success in Academic Writing. And this is the first time we've done it for postgraduates. So um, thanks for coming and um, otherwise I'll be talking to myself, really. So, so we put this programme together and we thought, yeah, before students, because students are always asking about referencing and writing, and I thought, well, actually, before they need to do that, they need to do some reading and research first, otherwise they won't know what to write. So we thought, well, actually, let's have reading and research uh, for this session. So I put the slides um, on the Moodle area, Management Postgraduate. So when you scroll down in Moodle on the left, there'll be lots of links. And if you can't see it, if you click down on the all arrow, it will show because maybe it's hidden away. And you have to go right down to the bottom when you open up that module. So I try and put those uh, slides there beforehand so you can see them before, so you know what's coming. So reading for university, I'm going to be talking about. And um, it's really important not just to read everything that you're given because you won't be able to keep up with it. There'll be too much. So you need to be selective and you need to be thinking, why am I reading this? What, do, what questions do I need answered? You're going to have to do lots of different types of reading depending on what you're reading for. You might be reading in week three about a new topic that you've never heard of before. And so you might be finding out about the vocabulary, about the main writers, about the main theories. You just want to have a little grasp of it. Or you might be doing some much more detailed reading because you've got an assignment to do and it's very, very specific. So you need to do a lot more reading in depth about that particular topic. So we're going to look at uh, different types of reading, different types of reading strategies, uh, being a more effective reader, taking notes and so on. And just in case you don't believe me, there it is. So we're going to look at identifying your reading goals, selecting what to read, reading more efficiently, being a critical reader, which is very important, and making effective notes. So, one of the things the lecturers do to help you is they give you a, a reading list. Is that right? Have you all got reading lists for your modules? <sighs> Thank goodness. Because that's very helpful. And sometimes there's a reading list for each uh, week, for each lecture as well, which is helpful. But it's not always possible to read everything. And sometimes the lecturers may have a book about a particular topic, read this chapter, and then they might have another book with a chapter about a very similar theme, and so on. Because the lecturers know sometimes you can't uh, obtain a particular book, so they might give, offer you another book. So if you can't find this one, here's another one on the same subject. So it helps uh, you to know that, well, actually, there are several books on this subject. And sometimes the, the authors are saying very similar things. If you can't read everything every week, then what I would recommend you do is make sure that you read the reading before the lecture. Are there any readings you've got to do before a lecture? Those are the most important ones. Because if you don't read those ones, then you're going to turn up to the lecture and you might not understand the topic. You might not understand what's being said. And also, if you read before the lecture, you're not going to understand everything, probably. But it will, the questions that you don't understand will make you more of an active learner when you go to the lecture because you'll be listening out, hoping that some of these questions you have are answered. You're listening out for answers to those questions or clarification. So it helps you to engage with the lecture material much more. And it's not to guarantee that you'll even understand then, but you'll have an opportunity to ask the lecturer afterwards about that. Or maybe even in the lecture if it's a small group. So rather than being a passive listener and sitting there waiting to be educated, you're there engaging with the ideas and the theories. And you're thinking about your position. What do you think? What do you think about these ideas? What's your opinion? Because lecturers want your opinion. And you might not have an opinion if you haven't done the reading and attended the lectures. 
So the reading's very important. The reading list, I should say, sorry. And the idea generally is for you to arrive at your own opinion. And so the reading list is like a, a launch pad. It's the introduction to this particular topic. But you'll have to do further readings as well, particularly if you're doing an assignment. But if you decide to move off the reading list to find your own materials, you really need to be clear what you're looking for. What, are you, what questions are you hoping to answer? Because otherwise, people go onto things like Google and they get 10,000 hits and it's too much. So there's even more uh, confusion. So make sure at least you do the pre-lecture reading. And then try and prioritise the other readings. What do you think is the most important, the second most important? And if you're not clear about that yourself, you can always ask your lecturers. There are too many items on the reading list. There are ten. I can't read them all. Which ones must I read? Which are the, the top, top three or top four? To make sure that you do read the most important ones. And there's a couple of tutorials on here on the links that you'll be able to have a look at in more detail. So, when you do your reading, it's important to have um, a reading goal. You need to have some questions that you want answered. You need to be clear, why am I reading this? Am I reading this because it's the first time I've studied this subject, I don't know anything about it, and I just want to have an idea what it's about. Who are the main writers? What are the main ideas? What are the main theories? So I'm just trying to familiarise myself with it. doesn't mean I understand everything, once I've done that reading, but I have a better idea than I had before I started. Is it because I've got some exams coming up, so I want to revise, and I want to revise particular topics, and I need to memorise certain authors and certain theories and certain arguments? Is it because I've got an assignment to do, and I've got to identify the key reading materials that will help me to write that assignment, so I need to focus much more narrowly on a particular aspect of a subject? and I need to become much better informed um, uh, and read much more widely. I'll have to read items from the uh, reading list, but also outside of the reading list. I'm going to have to find my own materials. So think about that before you start. Why am I reading this? What do I hope to gain from this? What will I do with that information? So, for example, if I make notes from my readings, what am I going to do with them? Am I just going to file them away and never look at them again? What am I going to do with that information? What questions do I want answered? So what slows reading down? This poor man is reading War and Peace, which I'm sure is a great book, but I've never actually got around to reading it because it was too long. I'm sure it must be over a thousand pages, but I've never, never looked. There are various things that can slow you down. One is not reading often enough, so reading rarely. It's important. Like any skill, if you're learning to play the guitar, you've got to practice every day, twice a day. It's like that with reading. To get better at reading, a more effective reader, you need to be reading regularly. And some people say, well, I can't read because I haven't got enough time. Um, I can only read half an hour a day. And then I say to them, well, what about times when you're, um, you're travelling, when you're on the train, on the bus? Can't you read then? When you're waiting for someone to turn up, you're meeting with someone. Maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, might be a valuable time. Maybe to read through your notes, maybe to glance through an article. Can I ask you how long um, you can concentrate reading for? How long can you read for before your brain starts to get very fatigued? Half an hour. Half an hour, okay. Oh, you're honest then. <laughs> so half an hour. So there's no point in deciding, I'm gonna sit down here and read for an hour, because if I do, that second half hour is going to be wasted time. Now, other people might be different. Somebody else might say 45 minutes. So it's important to match your reading time with your concentration time, your concentration span. And so for in half an hour, I mean, for me, I could read coming to work on the train and coming home in the evening. So I could have two half hours there. I could have half an hour at lunchtime. I could have another half hour um, at the end of the day. So I can have several periods when I'm reading. So if we can read little and often, we're going to be more effective. Sometimes people um, are slow because 
They don't recognise the word. They stop to look it up. I always do that when I'm abroad. I've got my dictionary and I'm reading a newspaper and trying to understand it. And I stop at every word. And it takes me about two hours to read a page. Well, that's a waste of time. Do I need to understand every word? I don't really, do I? Because very often I can understand it from the gist, the context. I can understand what the article's about, even if I don't understand every single word. But what I can do as well, I can keep my own dictionary. I can write my own glossary, my own dictionary, for my subject. Because there'll be words and phrases that keep cropping up. Maybe technical terms. So if I write those down in my dictionary and give a definition, write the definition beside it, then that will help me to remember. So next time, I might remember that word. I might remember that phrase. And also, I've got my dictionary there with the definition there. So it's, it's right, ready to hand. Sometimes stopping and starting. Going back over words. Going back over the last page. Going back over the last paragraph. Well, we don't want to keep doing that because that's going to slow us down as well. I mean, really, when you're initially reading, you're trying to identify what are the key points in this article or this chapter. I don't want to keep going back because I've already passed that point. Uh, as I'm reading, what I might well do is I might um, mark the different parts of the, uh, the text that are useful, that have got important points. I might put a post-it note on the important paragraphs, maybe. And then when I finish the article or the chapter, I can go back and read those important parts, the parts that were difficult or the parts that I thought, yeah, this is really going to be important for me to understand. Sometimes people slow, are slow because they've got no clear purpose. They're reading just because they've been told to, or they think this sounds a useful article, but without any questions to answer, not really sure what their uh, objectives are. And also that can be a reason for boredom. Sometimes people can get bored because they don't really know what they're reading. Or maybe because they're reading for too long. Somebody with a half hour attention span and they've moved into the 40th minute. So the last 10 minutes have probably been a waste of time. Even if they've made lots of notes, the notes aren't any use because they haven't necessarily understood the material. Sometimes taking too many notes. Have you ever taken so many notes that your notes are longer than the original article? I've done that. And then at the end of it, I thought, oh, that article wasn't so useful after all. That's no good to me. So I might as well throw these notes away. That was a waste of time. And sometimes reading every word, as I suggested, you don't necessarily need to know every word. You can understand uh, the ideas that are written about from the context. And you won't end up like that man there crying into his handkerchief. Reading for assignments is going to be very important. So normally you'll be given readings for uh, maybe for the assignment or maybe for that particular week in the lecture. And you do the reading. You understand a lot of it maybe, but not everything. So you have those questions in mind when you attend the lecture. And then the lecturer, he goes maybe over some of the material, explains it in more detail. Helps you to understand. And maybe he uh, explains some of those difficult ideas and theories, vocabulary even, that have been difficult to understand. So that's the second chance to explore some of that material. And then the third time, it's very good practice to go through your notes have a look through the lecture slides. Sometimes they have lecture capture here where they record the lectures and sometimes people look through those again. So that's a, a third opportunity to go through that material. So after this point here, after you've been through the readings, the lecture, you've got a fair idea and if you can go through the uh, recordings as well that would be even better you should have a good understanding. The more times you go through the materials, the more likely you are to understand them. And the more likely you are to develop your own viewpoint on a particular question, a particular uh, subject area. 
And it will make revision much easier for exams because you've been through that material once, twice, three times. Some students think, oh, well, I don't do the reading beforehand. I just turn out to the lecture. And the lecturer will tell me everything I need to know. But the lecturer can't. It's too complicated. There's too much material. They can only tell you. It's like a sort of greatest, greatest hits, the lecture. But there's a lot more information and details. I won't say too much about this, because I think Aidan might be talking about this, um, about uh, journal articles. I'm sure he will. But I think all of you will know about these library databases with lots of different journals in them. Am I right? No? Sure. Um, it's related to the back page. Um, when I'm starting to read something, suppose my lecturer gives some additional reading journals, and it takes up too long to collect all data from library or like I, I need everything in front of me before I start my reading and it's taking long to collect everything and then when I start reading I mean already a lot of time gone. Well I think I'd read one at a time. Do, why do you need everything at the same time? Yeah um, and I'm looking something from uh, GSTO and I, sorry, I couldn't find, I mean, is that possible to collect from home? Uh, I mean, is it possible to um, searching a library item from home? Yes. Yeah, yeah but um, today morning I was looking few item and I mean, I'm undone. <laughs> Sorry about that. I need to go to you, I know, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, it's going to, I mean, it, it's going to be very easier for us if I can do uh, from home because it's take, I mean, almost one hour from my home to library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, the, that's one of the great things about the resources in the library, that you can look at them um, from uh, afar. You don't have to be at Birkbeck to do that. And it's early days, isn't it? Is it the, it's the third week, so it's learning about how to use these different resources and how to access them. And sometimes we don't find things straight away. They're there, but maybe they're not in JSTOR. Maybe they're in ZTOC. Maybe they're in another database. You can try different databases. So, for example, there's all these different databases, and there's over 2,000 journals in each of them. Now, so JSTOR might have a particular journal for the last 10 years. But it doesn't have that journal before that date. It doesn't have it 11 years ago or 12 years ago. Maybe ZTOC has that. So although it's the same journal, they have different dates of their licenses that they're allowed to, to show, to make it accessible to you. So it could be that. I don't know, I'm guessing. Um, but it's really important to find out which are the most important databases for you. So, obviously, Computer Society, well, okay, I know what that's about. I know what those journal articles are about. Science Direct, is that all about science? No, it's not. It's about science, but it's also about social science. So that might have articles that might be useful. Business Source Premier, yes, definitely. So find out from your lecturers which are the most useful ones for you. Because this will save you a lot of time. Rather than going to Google, I've seen students' essays before, and I was looking at them, and they'd use Google, and Google had given them some hits that weren't academic sources. It had given them hits that were student essays. And so they were referring to other students' essays in their essay to support what they're trying to argue, which isn't a valid scholarly source. Because Google Scholar will give you, doesn't know you're a Burt Beck student, it will give you lots of different information. And some of it's not going to be valid. And some of it they may ask you for money for. They might say, yes, you can read this. Please send me £10 straight away. And, maybe, and it's probably free at the Burt Beck Library. Please. How, how do we know, for example, in management, I have to explore 
Everything they I will know which one is. No, not each of no, not all of them. Well, Business Source Premier would be definitely one. I actually I'm gonna answer that question next. Okay. I'm hoping I'm not taking too much from uh, Aiden here. <laughs> Spoiling his talk. Alright, it's not next, it'll be it'll be the one after this. So when you're reading journals, um, have you ever noticed there's a format, a structure to journal articles. Um, if you do, then it's quite helpful because then it's like reading a report. You think, well, actually, I don't really have to read the whole thing. I can just check the abstract, see what it's about. A summary. I can read that and that will tell me if it's worth pursuing this. Is it worth spending time on this article? I could read the introduction. Why is this research being done? Why is this article being written? What use is it? That's can, that can help me to make a decision. I might want to find out about the data and methods because maybe I'm doing a research project and maybe those data and methods might be useful to me for my research. A literature review, very useful because it's telling you about the main literature in, in the field. What's the state of knowledge as we know it at the moment? The results of the research, the discussion What's the significance of these findings? And the conclusion. So I don't necessarily need to read the whole thing. I could check in different sections, the abstract, the introduction, maybe the conclusion. So it's going to save me time. And in fact, when you're reading, just think, I'm not reading romantic fiction or a crime novel. I don't have to start at page one and finish at page 250. I'm not reading the whole thing. I'm just dipping into it and taking uh, any information that's useful for my research, for my writing, for my assignments. I'm referring to that information that's going to be useful for me. We'll get to that slide in a minute, I'm sure. This is uh, an interesting uh, thought from this student here, um, a business and management student. She said, in the beginning, I would always try at least to look at everything from the module's recommended reading list, including a large amount of journals. It took me a while to get used to skim reading them effectively. Now I usually read the abstract and the conclusion to make sure the journal suits the subject I'm interested in. Then, if so, I try to find the killer points in each paragraph. After you read journals, you realise they have a certain pattern, starting with an abstract, then the theory used, the methods of research, and explaining the findings, sometimes even limitations of research. So that student's worked that out for themselves. So it's quite useful to benefit from that student's um, experience. We're dipping in to texts to find those killer points, that important information. Aha! This is what I was trying to get going earlier on. So this is a lecturer from the University of East London talking about uh, critical reading. I think one of the hardest things that you'll find when you first get to university and a big change from doing A-levels or any study before university is actually university tutors aren't really looking for you just to repeat bits of information in your, in your, your ex your essays. Um, you know, you'll often see tutors say to you, you know, if I just wanted to read my lecture notes again, I'd go and read my lecture notes. But what they really want you to do is to take the material that they've presented to you, but then for you to think about it and say, how does this fit together with the stuff I already know? Does this, does this particular idea make sense? Are there problems with this idea? Does it maybe work in some areas but not in others? And it's that additional bit of critical thinking about the stuff that's been presented to you that really separates what you might have already done at school and college and then what you're going to do at university. And it's really that's the stuff, if you can start to get used to doing that, that really will boost your marks as you get into the second and third year. Because by, you, by the time you get there, that's what tutors are looking for, those critical thinking skills. 
The big thing that you need to remember to do when you start reading anything when you're at university is always try and be reading with a purpose. And the easiest way to do that is to have a question in mind that you want to answer while you're doing that reading. And while you're reading, think about that question. Once you've answered it, move on to the next thing because it's so easy especially when you start in the first year at university to get distracted by all this new material just read and read and read and read and unless you've got a purpose and you're not trying to fit that into what you already know and what you want to learn you can end up sort of getting overrun by the volume of reading being thrown at you. And sometimes what you can find is that you'll speak to other students who might have read half as much of you, of you have, as you have, but have done twice as well, because actually what they've done is they've targeted their reading and they've thought about what do I want to get out of this reading before, I, before they start. And I think that makes a really, really big difference. Thank you. That's a lecturer from um, University of East London. Is there anything that um, came from that that you find useful or interesting or surprising? What were the main points that came from that advice? Yeah, read with a purpose. So before you start reading, like I, I used to do a lot, sitting down, I'm going to read this chapter, I'm going to read this article, and I'm going to make lots of notes because the title sounds interesting or it sounds relevant. I haven't really focused on why this is useful to me. What am I going to do with it? When I make my notes, what am I going to do with the notes? Am I just going to file them away and never look at them again? What's the point? So why am I reading this? Am I reading this because it's useful to help me with my assignment, to find out more about this theory? Maybe I'm reading it because I want, it's the first time I've studied this topic, I need some more background information. What is the purpose of my reading this? What am I going to do with this information? And also thinking about when I do um, identify some killer points, some useful information, then thinking about what did I already know beforehand. Now if I add the two things together, what's my new knowledge? What's my new view, my new perspective? What have I found out? And the other thing that he said in the... F Sorry, go on. Sorry, uh, I have a question. Please. Uh, what kind of <coughs> questions uh, to... Before I read. Well, it depends why you're reading it. Um, if you've got an assignment to write, for example, um, you may have already made a start. You might have done the essential reading related to that particular subject area. And you might have used that to write a very uh, early draft. Um, but as you read through the draft, you might think, well, actually, there's some weaknesses in this first draft, in this essay. I need some more theory. I need uh, to see if there are uh, other positions on this particular argument, um, who, people who are going to argue against what I've uh, been suggesting in this essay. Um, or I might be looking for evidence to support what I'm trying to um, promote or suggest or argue. So I may well have questions there. Or it may well be... Oh, sorry, mate. Um, certainly I'm, I will have questions when I'm doing the initial reading. Maybe it's the first time I've ever studied this subject. It might be some of the vocabulary. I've got to find out what does this term mean? Um, what, are, what, are these, what is this theory about? I don't really understand it too well. So I've got questions in mind before I actually st start re doing the reading and I know what I'm going to do with that information, how it's going to be useful to me. Um, and that's what he's saying. I mean you can listen to that again um, if you like, because uh, you can have a look on the slides. Um, the thing in the first part, he said, it's important to have your own view. And that's what your lecturers want. They don't want you to repeat what they are arguing, just for the sake of it, just because you're trying to be polite. They expect you to have your point of view. Yeah and after a lecture maybe. Even if it disagrees with their point of view. It's not being rude. You're not being rude about them, saying I disagree. It's not like a personal uh, disagreement. It's about an argument, about a point of view. They expect you to do that. And they'll be disappointed if you don't have your own point of view. 
it should be hard to have my own views after the lectures. It should well, it's not many thinking. It's not just after the lectures, though, is it? Because you've done the reading before the lecture as well, haven't you? So you need to be thinking as you're doing the reading, as you're going to the lectures, what do I think about this? Do I agree? Do I disagree? And if I agree or if I disagree, why do I do that? And what evidence have I got to support my viewpoint? And what are the weaknesses in the counter viewpoints, the other views? Why am I discounting those views? Why am I not supporting those counter views? Sorry. But then, uh, when you write an essay, your view does not matter. Oh, it does. Your opinion, opinion doesn't matter. It's your critical. It's how you write it down, isn't it? Well, what you're doing is you. Some of it's sort of confusing. Now, okay, my opinion matters, but then I can say I think this. You have to do it critically. You have to do it critically. You weigh up. You're a little bit like a judge in the courtroom. You're listening to all the evidence. And you're weighing it up. You're thinking, do I think that's reasonable? Do I agree with that? And then the counter evidence. Do I think that's reasonable? Do I agree with that? Do I disagree with it? Where's the evidence to support these views? And obviously in relation to the question that I'm answering. And at the end, in the conclusion, I do give my view. But I don't write, like you say, I don't write I. I, I use the third person. This essay, this study or from the above arguments and evidence, it would be reasonable to conclude that this argument is stronger than the other argument because you're providing a rationale, the reasons for your viewpoint. So although it's not I, you are giving your view there. You're weighing up, sifting the evidence in relation to the question and you're arriving at your own independent view in the conclusion. Is that okay? So it's very necessary to have your own conclusion, even you can write your conclusion about yes. this essay. Yes. And it might be there's no conclusion, because the evidence is too weak. The evidence doesn't fully support one view or another. That's fine as well, because that is a conclusion, even if you're not uh, adopting one side or another. That's fine. Um, can I ask you something? Um, is there important, I mean, when we are starting an uh, essay about in subject, we have to show a book point. I mean, obviously our textbook or the required book, and then our research, and then our point. Is that something like that? A reference? Yeah. Citation? I mean, I know that's the thing that's all about our research, how we are doing the research. Well, you're showing the literature that you have uh, looked at in order to support your argument in your essay. But you must uh, reference that literature in your essay or in your report or whatever it is. And it's very important to um, read our textbook and the required book mm -hmm. because, I mean, and for any essay? Yes, yeah. You've got to use academic sources to support your view. Unless it's a newspaper or a magazine, um, you can use that, but you can't trust it on its own because it's not an academic source. So you need to look for other evidence that would support that particular source. So any source you use to support your writing, you need to reference it. Even if you've put the ideas in your own words. What about these sources? Do you think they're reliable or not? A blogs and chat room. Not really. You don't know who they are, do they? Do you really? Ebooks written by subject experts. Are they okay? I suppose if they're subject experts, it's presuming that they are academics or yeah, experts in the field. So they should be pretty reliable. But like any sources, you always look for other evidence as well to support that. Material and organisation websites written by enthusiasts, not experts. 
Not really, no. They're enthusiasts, so they, they're very in favour of that particular subject. So they're going to write glowingly. Wonderful, it's fantastic about it. So, no, they're not experts, so we can't really take their word. Official materials from a recognised institutional website, for example, the British Museum. Yeah, that should be reliable. Material on the home pages of individuals. No, because we don't know who they are, do they? Peer reviewed journal articles. You're, that's a yes. <laughs> yes. Because they've been peer reviewed. What does that mean? So someone else has checked them. Other academics have read them and put the thumbs up, said yes. That's good. The methods are valid. It's well written, well researched, well formatted, structured. So other academics have agreed that it is of sufficient quality and worth. Journal articles and book chapters published on an academic's homepage. Should be, shouldn't it? An academic, because the academic's got their rep reputation to think about as well. And it's public knowledge, people can look at that. Lecture notes on the website of an academic working at a recognised institution. So it's an academic's lecture notes. Is that okay? It depends, doesn't it, really? Because an academic could be writing, but they could be writing in a newspaper. So they're not held to such um, uh, high demands as if they were writing for uh, an academic journal or a book. So we've got to bear that in mind. And sometimes academics can go off their field. So I'm just thinking of Noam Chomsky, who's a famous linguist, world famous linguist. He writes a lot about politics. So he's going off his subject. So I might respect what he says about politics, but I might think, well actually, his area of expertise is linguistics. So I need to be careful. I respect what he's written. I might agree with it, but I've got to look for other evidence that can support his point of view. What do other people got to say about that? And here we are. That slide I said it was going to come up to. I knew it was going to come up somewhere. What was the question? Sorry. If, um, what resources for my for one's individual um, course? In my case, it's management studies. Right, well, there's lots of different resources. There's a textbook there. Um, so that is written by academics in management. Um, this is an undergraduate course, by the way. Um, so that would be fairly reliable, I hope. Very reliable. What about this one? Ooh, I've seen that sometimes in uh, reference lists of students. Now, there's an interesting article here by um, Harvard University. And they're saying, well, it's OK to go to sources like that, not to use them, but sometimes non-academic sources might be useful because they might explain something in simple language. It's not to say that I'm going to use that in my research, but it might explain something and then I can look at more academic sources. I could even look at the uh, reference list at the end of that article in Wikipedia. It might be useful. It might signal up um, academic sources. But certainly I wouldn't put that in my uh, reference list. Um, we saw that earlier on, the web of science. So the Social Science Citation Index. So that has over 2,000 journals on social science subjects. So that might be very useful. And that's been peer reviewed, those articles. So we should have confidence. What about Google Scholar? I mentioned that earlier on, didn't I? What did I say about that? Is it okay? It's good. I don't know how to link with Verbeck only. I need to ask you. If I want Verbeck. I'm sure Aidan could answer that one. 
I'll be listening out as well. Um, now, the problem with that, that's fine, but when you're searching Google Scholar, it doesn't know who you are. It doesn't know who you are. Um, and it might find a very useful article, but it might ask you to pay some money to read it. So please give me £10 and you can read it straight away. I think, well, no, actually, I've paid to be at Birkbeck. Why am I paying? And also, it might indicate that that article is in the Birkbeck Library. And then I think, oh, no. Why didn't I look in the Birkbeck Library first? I'm wasting my time here. And the other thing is, that will give you student papers. So student essays from around the world. And so students are writing their assignments. Sometimes they use those student essays and they don't even realise they're student essays. And also, the other thing is, it will give you too many hits. So I'm not saying don't use it, but be careful when you do use it. Treat it with caution. What about The Economist? Okay? Not okay? Okay. Can you use it? Do you trust it? Sometimes it's, it's that true that they, it always explains some personal views. Ah. Have you? About it? Yeah. Is it, is it true of the day? Is that a question or a statement? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. If no, you're right. Very personal views. Because it's not an academic journal. It is a journal. But it isn't just academic. Academics can write in there. But they might be like Tom Chomsky. He probably wouldn't write for that. But they might be writing off their area of expertise. They're not held to the same accountability as if they were writing for an academic journal. It's not peer-reviewed. Also, you can have journalists writing there, politicians, architects, all sorts of people. Are they experts in the field that they're writing about? Not necessarily. And also, as you say, it might not be impartial. It might be that they are trying to uh, promote a particular point of view. So I'm not just saying that we can't use articles from The Economist, but we must be careful. And we must look for other evidence outside of The Economist in academic sources to support what we are trying to argue. Because we need to look out for bias. You mentioned that. Maybe someone's trying to argue a particular point of view. So you need to think about what's this person's perspective. So if it was an economist, for example, you might think, actually, this person's very famous as an economist, but they've got a particular point of view. Because there are lots of different schools of economics. Maybe this person is a neoliberal economist who believes that the market is all-powerful. And we must do whatever the market wants. There must be no controls over it. OK, well, that's interesting. And that person's entitled to their point of view. But we need to take that into account when we're reading, we're reading their article. They have got a particular point of view that they are trying to convince us to believe. Doesn't mean we've got to believe it. We've got to look for the evidence that they use to support their argument. And we've got to think, well, what other schools of economics are there? What other arguments could there be in this particular case? So we need to be cautious. How do you look for the evidence if you are adapting all the articles? Well, you can find out what, what else is that author written. Where's it come from? What I'm saying is you need to be cautious. We don't know who it is. Is this an expert who's writing about their area of expertise? We need to be careful about opinions. Academics are very good at writing, as though, oh, it's obvious, isn't it? My point of view is right. They can be very forceful. And they can write as though there is evidence to support what they're trying to uh, argue. But in fact, if we read very deeply, maybe we'll find actually there's no evidence that they're bringing forward to support their argument. So we need to think, where is the evidence that this academic is using to support their argument? Is it there? Is it substantial? Is it valid? We need to look at the language. Sometimes it can be very emotive, opinionated, assertive. Emphatic. 
if it's emotionally charged, it's trying to argue a particular point of view, then we need to be a little bit careful because maybe that person isn't being impartial. Maybe they've got such strong views about this. And we need to look for sponsorship. Is this person being paid to promote these ideas? So if it was a scientist, for example, maybe they're being paid by uh, a pharmaceutical company to promote these particular drugs. Oh, so I've got to be a bit careful there then, because they're going to make money from it. So they will say, this is a new wonder drug. How, could, how do we identify them? <laughs> well, it's not always easy. It's not always easy. They should actually announce that. They should have that in the article at the end. They should say, this person is paid or sponsored. This article has been sponsored by... Like research, you know, when they have questionnaires, they normally should say, this, uh, this survey is being sponsored by... But they don't always. So, this is an interesting one. Glasgow University academic. He was against fracking. We keep, does everyone know that word fracking? It's sort of come into the language very recently. So you know when they shoot all this high pressure water under the, the ground and then it sends up, I'm not quite sure if it's oil or gas or whatever it is. And then we can use that to heat our homes and industries. Um, well, he, this uh, academic at Glasgow was saying, um, I, agree, I disagree with this, I think it's very dangerous. Um, but the problem is, is that Glasgow University were getting lots of money, sponsorship, from fracking companies. From companies that were making profits from fracking. So they didn't like it. So then Glasgow University cut off this academic's access to the library, to the emails. So he couldn't use the resources anymore. He couldn't do his research. So they cut off free speech because of sponsorship. So I'm just saying we need to be careful. We need to check. Is there sponsorship involved? Is, if there's money involved, there's always suspicion. Right, so I'm overrunning dramatically, so I'm going to have to move on here. So I talked about different types of reading. There are different types of techniques as well. Things like scanning, when we're looking for specific information. Skimming, we're reading through quickly to get the gist. And then critical reading, which is in-depth reading. So this scanning is when we are checking to see if an article or a chapter might be useful. But it's also useful when we're reading maybe some of the essential reading texts and we're looking out for key information. So, before we read in detail, we don't want to waste our time. We might read something in detail and at the end of it think, well actually, that's not quite as useful as I thought it was going to be. I can't use it. So we need to be detectives before we start. We need to look for clues to see, is this text going to be useful? So, what we can do is we can scan our eye over the text to identify the key words, to look for the structure, to look at headings, figures, contents, the reference list, the abstract. And as I said earlier, earlier maybe use post-it notes to mark key parts of the text. And then we can go back and maybe read those paragraphs or half pages or pages in more detail. Because we've identified that there are key parts of this text. Or maybe we haven't. Maybe we've identified, actually, this text isn't of any use to me at the moment. That's scanning. Skimming is when we look over a particular document and we can go through the whole document quite quickly to see, is this document worth spending time on? We're trying to get the gist of it. A, a, sh a sort of shallow, I suppose, understanding of it initially to determine, is this worth spending time on? So, if you found a journal article, for example, and it sounded as though it might look useful. You might read the abstract first of all. That sounded, oh yeah, that's useful. And then you might read through it very, very quickly, looking for keywords, looking for uh, the arguments, looking for the evidence, to decide, is this worth my while spending more time on? And if you spent 10 minutes on it and you still can't decide, then maybe it's not worth spending time on. Maybe you're wasting your time. Maybe you're looking for something that isn't there. 
So it's checking, skimming and scanning, to see is this article worth spending time on and identifying key parts of the text. And if it is, then it's time to do the, key, the, the critical reading. This is where you look at those sections that you've identified as having important information in them. And it might take you several times to read through those in order to understand them. And think about how you can use that information to improve your knowledge or to use to help write the assignment. Identifying those key parts of the text. So when you're reading, you're critically examining, why am I reading this? What's the purpose of my reading? What are the authors trying to achieve in writing this? What are they arguing? What are the authors claiming that's relevant to my work? How does it relate to what I'm trying to do? How convincing are these claims and why? So looking at what they're trying to argue and looking for the evidence. Where's the evidence to support what this person is arguing? And finally, in conclusion, what use can I make of this information? What can I do with it? What do I know now that I didn't know before? Adding together what I already knew plus this new information. I put the two together. What's my new understanding of this particular subject? Actually, I'm going to rush on because otherwise um, I, don't, I want Aidan Aiden to have enough time. Um, that note-taking form seems to appear in every single slide that I do, you know, every single presentation. Um, it's quite a useful form because it reminds you at the top there, it reminds you to write the name of the author, the publication, uh, the title of it, um, the year of publication, the pages and so on, and the subject, what's it about. And so you can use that to make notes, to keep a record. When you are making notes, it's worth a while just writing a few words or phrases. Don't write whole sentences. Because if you write whole sentences, then the problem is, is then you might retain the, straight, the structure, the writing style of the original author. You're just trying to write down the key points about that subject that when you do type in your sentences in your essay, you're putting them into your own words. I won't mention EndNote because I know Aidan doesn't like it. He'll tell you about something better. So when you're making notes, read first, make notes later. Like I said, otherwise you might end up with lots of notes that you never look at again. Don't just copy. Put it into your own words. Write words or phrases. Ask yourself, what's the point of my notes? What am I going to do with them? If I'm just going to file them away and never look at them again, then why am I making the notes? What use is it? Or maybe it's useful to make the notes because in the very act of making the notes might help you to remember and to consolidate what you're learning. Well, that's perfectly valid. You could use an underliner. I quite like using post-it notes because you can write on the post-it notes and uh, make notes about why you've uh, marked this section. Respond to the text. That's helping for you to form your own opinion. What do you think? Do you agree with this? Do you disagree? Why do you agree? Why do you disagree? Keep checking the assessment title. This is if you're going to write an assignment. When you're doing the reading, make sure you have the title of the assessment, the title of the essay there, so that it keeps you focused at all times. Have a look at your notes at the end. Do they make sense? And you should keep a record of the page numbers and the reference information, and be meticulous and accurate, so you know your words, or you know if you've written a quotation, word for word, because you put speech marks around it. So, I had to get Batman here uh, in this particular slide, um, and he's got some very good advice. Prioritise your reading. Number one, the essential reading list. That's important. Now, I've seen student essays before and they haven't used any um, text from the essential reading list. And the student said, um, well, I didn't because I thought I had to find my own text. I thought I wasn't allowed to use anything from the essential reading list. But you must. The lecturer spent many hours 
collecting together these texts to tell you that these are key texts for this subject. So you're expected to use the essential reading list. That's the first priority. Second priority is in the lectures and the seminars. The lecturer may mention a writer, might mention a text or research, but it's not written down anywhere in your module materials. Because there are too many writers, there are too many texts to put them all in your module outline. But if you do hear a lecturer mentioning a writer or, or some research that you hadn't heard before, write it down. And maybe another student might mention a writer because many of the students at Birkbeck have studied before this particular subject. They might work in the field. They might have a, a knowledge about particular writers and research. So note those down. And also, within the essential reading, if you look within those texts, there'll be citations, the reference list will refer to particular writers that the authors have drawn upon to support their particular arguments. Well, it might be that you look at some of those um, items in the reference list and think, well, actually, I'd like to read that in more detail because I think there's a lot of valuable information from that author. I'd like to discover it for myself. So that's number two. And number three is you need to show your research skills. And so you can research, show your own research skills by using the Birkbeck Library materials, finding your own journal articles. Because at postgraduate level now, your lecturers are expecting you to use the journals. Because the journals are much more up to date. The journal research will be focused on particular aspects of particular subject areas. Please. Is there any specific uh, time that, uh, like, last, two, I mean, we can use from last 2012? I mean... Depends what the subject is. I mean, if you were writing about uh, computer science, maybe anything in 2012 might be outdated. Mm -hmm. um, if it was uh, business management uh, theories, well, 2012 probably wouldn't be that out of date. But certainly get as up to date as you can. But just because it's three years old or five years old or ten years old doesn't mean that it's uh, passe. It doesn't mean that it's of no value anymore. Borgbeck has no problem if I collect something from, I mean, backdated. And it's like if it's from 2010 or 12. Probably not. It depends. The trouble is it will be, it won't look very good if those ideas from 2010 um, have been developed and they're very old-fashioned now and maybe there's new research that maybe uh, shows that that 2010 research is, um, has, has got weaknesses in it and you're not aware of that. But just because it's 2010 doesn't mean that it's out of date. It depends what, it, what it's about really. Because I heard that at some university they don't allow before 2012. I mean, is that... I think that's something you should check with your lecturer. Because that will help your research. That will narrow it down as well, then, won't it? Yeah. Sorry. It's, uh, you, s you mentioned about um, making note when the lecturer or, or other student mention any authors or something. And uh, I am really, I, I'm thinking when I did, I don't even take notes because uh, I have enough with the essential plus the third I'm reading. I think I have enough, sort of thing. But I shouldn't. Well, it might. Like what you could do is you could make a note of it for future reference. Because suppose you have to do an assignment on the subject that has been mentioned. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you might want to read it now. But in the future, you might think, well, actually, that's a useful reference. I'm going to look at that one because that might help me to write my assignment. You can't read everything. You know, if someone gives you 20 books to read, it's too much, isn't it? But you might read them, not the whole books, but the chapters over a period of time. That's, what, that's the trouble, because we see the essential reading list, and it's all there. But we don't have to do it all now. This is over maybe a period of a year. Well, not a year, but... No, what am I saying? Over a period of a term. So, you know, maybe over a term, it's not too bad. If we spread out the reading, bit by bit, and we have a reading week as well, maybe it's more manageable. And we have to prioritise what are the most important things that we need to read first. I'm going to stop there because I've overran my time, so apologies for that.